It's Stargrave week and we have prizes up for grabs. We'll be choosing winners from three of our communities. One from the comments on YouTube, one from the comments from OnTabletop.com and one from the Cult of Games members so you guys get an extra chance to win. Make sure and get your comments in and we hope you enjoy the week. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Stargrave Week. And we are joined by the creator of Stargrave, Joe McCullough. Uh, Joe, it's a pleasure to have you on the show with us once again. Yeah, it's great to be back. Always fun. So, I suppose, first off the bat, Stargrave. Um, yeah. I, I suppose people want to know, what is it? And, <laughs> and if they've got this far... Then they they're in from? for a bumper ride for the rest of the week, but yeah, uh, but yeah, basically from the moment Frostgrave came out five plus years ago, people asked me, "What are you doing the sci-fi version?" And um, <laughs> you know, it, it's one of those things that in the back of my head, it's like I love fantasy, I love sci-fi, maybe I will someday. But I wasn't in any rush to do it because, well, one, I just finished Frostgrave and was still exploring that and and tinkering with that, but. But as it is, you know, as I love sci-fi and it's one of my favorite genres, I always knew I wanted to get to it. But but I wanted to wait until I really felt like, A, comfortable as a game designer and comfortable with mm. the system that I could then take that system and play with it and tinker with it and modify it in ways that, that gave the, the gamers a different game experience. Because um, I didn't, mm. you know, I didn't want to just put out Frostgrave in space. I wanted it to be present two games so that players actually would decide tonight I feel like Frostgrave or tonight I feel like Stargrave and not just because I get guns in one and, and swords in the other. So, <laughs> sure. yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's fascinating. So was it, was it the launch of second edition then of Frostgrave that, that sort of went, well, that's now polished off and, and that's in a position that I'm happy with. That means I can go and explore yeah. the wider universe. Literally. I, I think so. I mean, I think it was, it partly, yeah, going through that process was kind of, yeah, the culmination of feeling comfortable with the, the base system, you know, that I've, I've worked on in, in other games and in other ways. But, yeah, once I had that down, I really felt like, okay, that's that's done for a while and that's in a good place and it gives me a great base to, to launch this. And now it's time time to move on and, um, you know, and just watch a lot of sci-fi movies. So <laughs> it really starts yeah. getting so the, the juices flowing and... Yeah. And they get involved in there and get some robots in there, you know. <laughs> Everybody loves a robot. We, yeah, we, exactly. we end up with we end up with the uh the science fiction war game in the ravaged galaxy. So yep. I suppose Frostgrave had the the idea that uh the frozen city was uncovered again. Uh in in this we've got um a background of massive warring civilizations who have more or less um Rubbered, I think is the phrase. Yeah. <laughs> the universe, every everything that was great has gone away, and now people are just clinging on and, and fighting to survive, mm. which is a, a an interesting way of doing it. It's, it's almost post apocalyptic for everyone, um, and then you're not having to worry so much about here's a, a galaxy spanning empire coming in and, right. and ruining your cruise, uh, your happiness, I suppose. Most yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, with all my games, I try to keep them just a little bit background light so that the players have a lot of room to kind of interpret the kind of the setting in the way they want both terrain wise and both narratively and um so yeah i thought that was a great way to do that because while well, yeah the universe has kind of been or the galaxy has kind of been wrecked you know different parts of it have kind of been left in different different states so you know you could still have an isolated kind of high tech city. So if you wanted to, to use your nice high tech kind of terrain, you can you can justify that. But if you got nothing but ruins you want to throw on the table, it's easy to justify that too. And really to yeah, allow players to give it any kind of polish or, or sheen they want and to kind of fit it into their most popular kind of sci-fi universe. So if you want to play it more like Star Wars, it's pretty easy to see it that way. If you want to play it more like Firefly, you can see it that way. Well, I didn't see it till afterwards, like the, the most recent series of uh, Star Trek Discovery, you know, yeah. which is basically a post-apocalyptic Star Trek uh, kind of universe. 
a little bit higher tech in general than, than you're going to get in, in Stargrave, but, but easy enough to see how you could kind of work that in. So I also needed a universe where you would have these guys flying around kind of free, free from the law, essentially. I mean, there, there are these kind of overarching pirate fleets that don't so much enforce the law as their own will, but, but ones where, you know, you can be a good guy or you can be a bad guy. And either way, you still have to kind of keep a low profile, you know. <laughs> and it's very, it's very much sort of flowing into that idea that I guess we saw again with Frostgrave, where it's kind of like building the world that you want to build and telling the stories that you want to tell, and yeah, using absolutely the framework for that in order to create what you want on the tabletop. Which I think it's always <laughs> yeah. I mean, and this time you've got an entire galaxy to oh, play yeah. with, you know, which is both incredibly freeing and, and actually quite difficult. As a designer, sometimes so like when it came to working on the bestiary, it's like, okay, <laughs> anything I can imagine, you know, like any type of alien, any type of monster could be in there. I, I guess that's a, that's an interesting one because obviously, with well, not obviously, but with magic, you've got certain kind of like established laws and stuff that you may have yeah. with magic, in that you know, there are the guys that cast fireball and that kind of thing, but when it comes <laughs> to sci fi, suddenly you've got all these varied alien races that you can just dream up and play around yeah. with that there must have been some interesting sort of angles that you were diving into when it came to as you say building the best and stuff and the, and the different yeah. Cat roles and things as well yeah i mean so i guess the, the the first difference between say frostgrave and stargrave that players are going to really notice is is those kind of central characters so in, in frostgrave you get your wizard and your apprentice and here you've got a much more so you, you still have a captain and a first mate. So it sounds like it on the, the surface, but yeah. you're defining those by their backgrounds. And those backgrounds are more significantly different than, than say, the, the wizard schools are. Because everybody's a wizard in Frostgrave. Here you can be a cyborg or you can be, mm. you know, kind of a mystic or you can be an old veteran soldier or just a rogue, you know. And, and they all have their kind of own core power sets and stuff. And um, so you can get some really different kind of play styles and, and views of your your guys. Um, and also in this one, your captain and your first mate can have totally different backgrounds. So they can have totally different power sets. So you can really kind of tinker with your your crew in a way that you can't quite as well in, in Frostgrave. So and and in some ways, I see that I see Stargrave as just that kind of ten percent more complex than Frostgrave. Yeah. I gave myself a little more wiggle room, um, both because I think a lot of the players are coming out of Frostgrave, so they're going to have those core things down anyway, so we can move beyond the focus of that, but also because it is a, a bigger galaxy and there's more stuff out there. Yeah. You know, I wanted to give myself a little more freedom of possibility by making it, allowing myself to make it a little more complex in parts. So. Yeah, that, that was certainly something I noticed when it came to crew creation. The fact that you weren't starting with a captain and then the first mate was essentially one level lower. <laughs> you're starting with a captain, yeah. a captain's level 15, yeah. and the first mate is is zero or one. Zero. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. So uh, he's he's right at the bottom um, yeah. and, and has has to work to, to drag his way up there. So you're not... <laughs> You're not getting that sort of well. You're not getting the the sorcerer's apprentice feel to you're not you know here is my little uh, apprentice and I will teach him the occasional thing that I've learned and pass it on. You can have very different um, pairings that can be complementary or or just completely out there for your own personal <laughs> amusement. Yeah, um, I mean it gives you the chance that, you know if you wanted mm. to, to have Luke Skywalker and Han Solo in, in your crew. <laughs> you know, essentially you get the one guys. I've got my Vorpal blade and the other guys. Yeah. Let's hide in the the cargo pods and <laughs> come out later. Yeah. But so sort of, sort of after the kind of um, captain first mate phase, you've got the ability yeah. to build up your crew. So could you kind of walk yeah. us through how that's sort of done in the game and sort of what's tweaked and that kind of thing? So. Yeah. So so that'll be a little more familiar for us great players because you've got again you're going to have eight soldiers ish and and again I've divided them into kind of standard and specialists which um, is really just a balancing mechanism. So your, your standard guys are, are kind of, well, they're, they're standard. They're, they tend to be the guy with the gun or your hackers or such, whereas your, your specialists tend to have the special weapons. So your, you know, your rapid fires, which can be your machine gun or your 
you know, any, anything that has a high volume of fire or your flamethrowers or your grenade launchers. Um, and it's just a way to, to keep people from getting carried away, uh, taking a load of those. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you, you can, you can assemble a crew that's got four grenade launchers if you want. Um, it's probably not the best move, but, but you can do that, but you, can, you at least can't have a crew that's eight grenade launchers. Is that, that yeah. Be yeah. Tires. <laughs> but, um, but, the, but there's a lot of different kind of mixing and matching you can do. And, um, and one of the big differences here is, um, unlike Frostgrave, you've got kind of two different types of treasure represented on the board at one time. Um, because of, as as I thought about it, like what are what are what are you after in these games? Obviously, you're after loot, but what, but what does loot mean? And in a, in a sci-fi universe, it can mean a couple of it can mean a lot more things than it can mean, I think, in a fantasy. So it can still be that you know, chest full of gold or money or the nice plasma rifle, but it can also be information. It can be, you know, mm. schematics or mm. formula or, you know, things that are represented digitally. Um, so in the game, you've got both physical loot counters and, and, and data loot counters. And um, unlike Frostgrave, you can't just run and pick them up. You've got to run and unlock them. Yeah. And that's either, you know, busting open the thing they're in and getting it out, or it's, you know, breaking through the firewalls and downloading it. So now you can take soldiers that are kind of specialists at, at doing one or the other of those. Um, and having those mechanics actually proved really useful because it allowed me to do a lot of other things in scenarios of like, mm -hmm. you know, you need to break into the the elevator system. You know, you've now, I now just say, you know, treat it like a data loop thing and, you know, have your hacker try to break into that. So it gives you a bit more diversity in your soldiers and more thinking about, you know, your crew. Do I want to be kind of a, we're always going for the data. So I've got a couple of hackers or do I want to be more diverse and, um, you know, have parts on for every situation. But. The thing that I quite liked about it was that it, it, it sort of felt like it moved away from me, at least from the idea of the wizard has hired a bunch of mooks to follow him around <laughs> and die before he can, so he can get the loot. Whereas in yeah. this one, it's like, I actually care a little bit about my crew that I've brought along with me. I feel a bit sad that they've died. <laughs> yeah, it is. I think it is supposed to be that way. Yeah. You know, it's, these are the guys you've, recruited more than in in frostgrave it oh you're with me now you know <laughs> these are guys who for whatever reason are, are fighting for the same cause so yeah you feel about them a little bit more <laughs> less likely to grab the treasure and dive off the top of a three-story tower <laughs> 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 that it worked for me hey <laughs> as yeah. one people ask me about is that legal under the rules yes you know should it be well Yes, because, you know, who am I to say whether your guy would jump off a tower? <laughs> he, was, he was on his way out anyway. Exactly. That's risks. kind of up to you. So. And, and this is, I suppose it's that semi-RPG thing mm. uh, about about the degree of games um, that fascinates me because with Stargrave, you've brought in a ship. Yeah. Um, and that ship can be upgraded in a similar way that you can, you know, upgrade your your first mate and your your captain uh and that i think is, is a beautiful little thing because it gives the idea that they are a crew on a ship and maybe they're just keeping flying uh in a a firefly kind of way they're scraping by or they're doing really well and you know they can afford to, <laughs> to yeah. upgrade that that old um crew compartment into being a med facility which will then help you out in the the later games when you actually come to play sort of campaigns and keeping your crew alive and, and that I, I think is a, a beautiful um addition to the 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 rule set that it's not just a group of people on a planet to a mission on a planet to a mission that that you have this home base that can be expanded upon and built upon um do you do you have any plans to take that further or uh, in I subsequent keep, books? Or is, or is that just nation well, that's good where it is? I, I keep thinking about it and, and I keep not succeeding in, in all honesty. Mm. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I'd love to work kind of ships into the game more, but I haven't figured out a way to make it fun. Um, you know, like, because when you get right down to, I don't want to just, you know, I could create another game that's about fighting starships, but it would just be another game, you know, and, you know, you could tie it in, but I don't think it would ever feel right. Whereas in the kind of small table sizes you're using, generally bringing in a ship just kind of makes a mess of whatever scenario you were. Sure. I, I do. I would like, I think at some point to maybe write a few scenarios in which you're, you're only 
evacuation possibility is your ship. So you have to bring it in kind of at the conclusion of a scenario. Um, I haven't done that yet. I think the thing that's quite nice about the idea of, in effect, base building, though, within these campaigns mm -hmm. is that it kind of, it adds more uh, meaning to what you're doing, as Jerry was saying. And I think it also, it, it, it kind of plants seeds for creating your own stuff and it down the line. So maybe you're playing a scenario that you've played before, but this time it's set on your ship. And so yeah. you, you bring in all the terrain elements and things that you've built up over that time. And that can kind of add to like a little bit more of a narrative edge to things because suddenly the enemies found their way onto your vessel and stuff, which is yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I mean, one thing like, you know, you, you can't think about it too much because if you think about if I actually had a ship that 10 people could live on, I think it's going to be absolutely <laughs> massive yeah. Yeah. represented on a table. Yeah, it's not, it's not a piece of terrain. It is the table. <laughs> like, yeah. So, Although just yeah. the idea of having to defend your ship from yeah. uh, some sort of a crew or pirate crew coming in to, to you know jump in and take it over it means you could do some quite nice um i suppose dungeon yeah. crawl-esque sort of ship layout plans and stuff and yeah yeah i mean ships are i mean they're such a part of of the genre i mean you think about yeah. like in uh the mandalorian when the razor crest gets destroyed that's like the worst part of the year like, no! oh, <laughs> yeah, oh, my heart. <laughs> just gut wrenching isn't it <laughs> like that that was that was a great ship. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think we speak for everybody when we say that they were terrible people and they yeah. deserve to die after that. Um, going back to sort of like the the core of the game, um, yeah. the the basis of it again is very much like the D twenty system and that kind of thing. Could yeah. you sort of walk us through sort of like how typical turns play out? Again, very similar yeah. to Frostgrave, but there are a few tweaks and stuff like that. So. Yeah, absolutely. So, so you're going to have the basically the exact same activation system um, of kind of breaking it down into to captain phase, first mate phase, crew phase. Um, Cause I think that that proved one of the real strengths of Frostgrave because it just keeps everybody involved and, and, and moving quickly. Um, and yet, you know, your movement is handled exactly the same way. Your, your melee combat is exactly the same, except that um, it doesn't happen near as often because one of the things that, I mean, probably the biggest thing that I discovered when starting working on it is just handing everybody a gun really changes the game massively. <laughs> Even if you didn't make any other change, actually, yeah. this completely changes the tactics of the game. Um, and I, also the presence of things like grenade launchers and flamethrowers that, that are template weapons, all of a sudden standing next to your captain, which is a good idea activation-wise because it'll activate earlier in the turn, may not be such a great idea because you're now in the blast radius of things. Mm. So it really makes you think about how you group your figures and, and whether it's worth taking that risk to get the earlier movement versus uh, yeah. the possibility of getting blown up. Um, and um, again, you've, you've, you're going after loot tokens. Um, so the, the whole key to loot tokens, it's, it's, although it's about grabbing the stuff, it's also about forcing you to split your figures on the table. And um, again, you're gonna have to do a little more thinking about that this time because um, you've got the two different types of loot. It takes longer to get it. So instead of just kind of, the, the tactic of running up and just grabbing something and, and beelining it off doesn't work quite as well in Stargrave. So it's it's more about kind of careful positioning and maneuver and, and securing something and, and then moving. Mm -hmm. um, and the other, I guess, big thing, the other big difference I found is, again, equipping everyone with a gun means that, uh, as compared to Frostgrave, say, the spells themselves aren't quite as good. Um, so all the captains have powers. and um, But, you know, I couldn't make one of those powers just like fireball because everybody can already throw a fireball in the game, in theory. So these powers need to do different <laughs> things. Um, so there's a lot more kind of different little things you can do and, and different ways to influence uh, the game while you're going on. Um, but even that, I, I realized it doesn't encourage players to do it quite as much as I wanted. So late, late in the kind of playtesting process, I added the, the, what I call the power move. So your captains and first mates can spend an action to use a power. And when they do that, they also get to make a free move. Mm -hmm. So it makes them much more kind of maneuverable on the table. Um, 
in fact, it it allows them to do something that no other figures can do, which is kind of pop out of cover, use a power, and then get back into cover. Um, so these two figures now have a capability that none of the other figures have, and it makes it much more um, fluid. Right. And, and yeah, and then just gives you again more things to think about, and makes those characters a little more special uh, in a way that I think they should be uh, during the game. But so. Yeah, I think in some ways, the first time people play Stargrave, they're going to see so much familiar that they're going to try to play it like Frostgrave, and then they're going to realize that doesn't work so well. So while they're going to be comfortable with the rules, yeah. it's going to take take people a while to figure out the, the tactics they, they want to use and should be using. And, you know, there are a lot of different because those different powers, you know, you can do things like unlock loot remotely if you have the right powers and stuff so you can play a, a quicker game you know or you can use powers to to try to explode your enemy but it's not quite as uh as good a way to go perhaps as it is in, in frost Graves. so so yeah a lot of the same but different yeah. <laughs> yeah. and then and then you've also got that layer of the um i suppose the tech on top of it so you've got somebody who can possibly unlock a a bit of loot via power, but then maybe a crew member on the other side has got a data virus and yeah. that piece of, of tech that they're attempting to unlock or they've worked their way towards all of a sudden becomes very difficult to unlock indeed. Right. Um, so you, you, you've got this, this uh, sort of playoff because you, you have the, the sci-fi tech that allows you to do much more over a greater area, I suppose, is, is possibly a way of looking at it. Um, so things aren't as cut and dry as they would be when somebody's coming towards you with a dagger. Um, <laughs> you know, you, you've got to deal with, with those. And, and even things like the uh, wear and tear on giant stumpy powered armored suits uh, right. that require you. Yeah, they are fantastic. But if most of your credits are going back in just to be able to, <laughs> to have that, then is it really the best option to have on the tabletop for you and your crew? Maybe not. Yeah. You know. I mean, it, you know, I wanted... I wanted that in there because I wanted, if you want that space Marine or that Mandalorian, you know, somebody with the, the super cool combat armor, you can have it, but you're not going to have a whole crew of them. And yeah, it's, no. it's, it's very much a question of, is it worth it? You know, it's worth it as I'm standing on the table, but in the long term, yeah, maybe, maybe not, you know? So, but that, yeah, that, that one was quite a challenge to think of because it's mm -hmm. really numerically kind of pushing numbers and you know <laughs> one of one of the um the other thing like obviously is I, I, there's that nice scenario focus to the game where it's not just killing your opponent mm -hmm. you, you know you have that focus of the loot and stuff but then that also ties in other elements uh of which we alluded to earlier of like pirates and you know which is the unwanted attention that arrives as the game right. goes on and then you've obviously got the aliens and other things that could arrive as well at the same time <laughs> Um, did you have a lot of fun playing around with that and sort of, you know, getting the idea of, ah, there's lots of explosions going on. The pirates are definitely going to hear this kind of. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was that's one of those times where story and and rules really come together in a way that's really kind of delightful as a, as a game designer because um, I had this background of like you know these giant pirate fleets roaming around, making they're the reason that it's kind of tough to do a lot of what you want to yeah. do, yeah. but um. But also, as I like, you know, was kind of working on it, I realized the kind of uh, random encounter system you have in Frostgrave doesn't necessarily work in in Stargrave. It does if you happen to be out in a jungle fighting something, or you know, on a barren moon. Or, but um, but if you're in the middle of a town, like you're not going to just have you know dinosaurs wandering in, <laughs> not often anyway. So I needed, a, yeah, a second kind of rule that was if you're fighting in an urban environment, and, th and that became unwanted attention, and there you get. What is generally the pirates, though it could be used to represent local law enforcement and, and stuff like that. But the, the other nice thing about that was because as I was working it out and as I was saying that the tactics on the table are different, um, what I didn't want to get into was a situation where you get a very fixed game of we establish our firing positions and you establish yours and we just shoot it out until somebody's dead. Um, so now, because of the unwanted attention, you have got to go and try to at least get a hold of the loot because these other bad guys are coming. You know, the longer you go, the more of them will show up and they will never stop showing up. So <laughs> <laughs> you can't just sit there sniping at your enemy forever. You've got to move. And um, 
Yeah, so yeah it really again, adds the ticking clock to the, the, the game. Absolutely. And uh, in, in a very narrative way as well, where you, you like you say, they, they're just going to keep coming and coming and take all of your toys off you. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Probably murder you to boot, so uh, get in, get out as quickly as you can. Exactly. And it just gives you a great excuse to, you know, again, use stormtroopers if you want to use stormtroopers or, you know, your yeah. space orcs or whatever as, as you kind of another chance to use the fun miniatures. So that's because that's what yeah. it's all about at the end of the day. So Very much so. Um, but, are there any of the scenarios in the book that are a particular favorite for you um, on the narrative side? Yeah. So I've got, there, there's one I really like, well, there's several I really like, I really like them all, but <laughs> I think my favorite is uh, called the Derelict Warship, which is basically your cruiser flying around and a, a warship falls out of the warp and it's one of the old ones from the war and it's all beat up and, and destroyed. And um, But, you know, that's still a treasure trove to you if you can get in there and rip some of the good stuff out. What I, what I like about that one is you, you get on there and it's, Basically, it's decaying around you, so it's it's breaking apart, and and at one point it can even go critical, and you know, you gotta you gotta run, but also it can you can have um, basically the containment shields failing, so that you're getting sucked in various directions as the the holes open in space, and just a lot of fun, really. Like, oh gosh, you know, why did we why did we do this kind of moments? This seemed like such a good idea at the time. Exactly, <laughs> I think. People who know my games know I'm a, I'm a big fan of chaos on the tabletop, and uh, that one that one's got a high degree of, of chaos. So, because <laughs> that is where you get those great story moments, you know. It's not sure. just we got in there and we got the loot. It's we got in there and the ship was failing, and you know the the bulkhead froze, so we had to go the other way, and <laughs> the gravity turned off. None exactly. of our mag boots worked. Exactly. We're floating into walls. So, I mean, I do. More, more, more so than Frostgrave. I tried to like make it really clear, like talking about this. Uh, you know, use whatever terrain you've got because hmm. I've got a whole galaxy to play with, and I've got ten scenarios in the book, and they're literally all set on different planets or in space. So, if you're following it exactly as I've written, you need ten different terrain sets, um, which yeah. I know some people are going to view as this wonderful challenge. Others are going to go, "Oh my goodness!" But you know. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter whether it's, you know, a swamp or a jungle or, you know, a temperate forest or even just like a field of crystals, you know, as long as you kind of following the kind of set pieces of the scenario, like you need a building of some sort in the middle. Yeah. So give people a real chance to use their terrain collections, but also not stress out about it. Yeah, well, I think uh, if there's one thing we've learned from the likes of firefly stargate and star wars is that sometimes when you think you're not in kansas anymore you are so, <laughs> exactly. you, you, can, you can get away with the low tech yeah, yeah if you, as long as you've got a rock quarry um terrain set and a Canadian <laughs> forest yeah. you're fine so. no, you're, you're grand. well it sounds very exciting then for the the future of uh of sci-fi gaming uh with stargrave i uh, i know I'm, i've been digging out all sorts of stuff myself and a lot of other people have been following suit where miniatures have been dusted off i haven't seen the light of day in decades uh with the the idea of of recreating or uh repurposing them for stargrave so uh it will be terrific to see what the uh the community as a whole does when they they start digging in and, and playing the games themselves because at the moment there's just an awful big push on people trying to get crews ready and ships yeah. ready and terrain <laughs> ready uh so folks we're going to move on here um enjoy the rest of the week we've some battle reports coming uh there'll be a few painting guides and then at the end of the week we'll be talking to joe once again to talk about the future for stargrave and what That's we great. can hope to see so until then get your comments below and we'll speak to you soon Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.